For this video, I'm going to explain the differences between an FPGA and a microcontroller, the battle of the embedded processors, and discuss some opportunities where you might use one versus the other. So let's dive in. All right, first of all, let's talk about this battle. Um, often you do need some smarts in your electronics, um, some software to control things, turn things on, turn things off, blink an LED, whatever. Uh, these appear in pretty much every application you can think of. Toys, consumer electronics, robotics, all of it. There's always some smarts, there's some software. Um, there's high level software, there's low level software, there's, there's different types of software everywhere. Um, at the low level, you really have two possible options for your software. Uh, there's FPGAs, which are uh, field programmable gate arrays using VHDL and Verilog as their, so as their option. And there's also a lot of microcontrollers available and also ASICs for very high volume stuff. So if you have a million of something, you might want to spin your own ASIC, but let's just pretend there's only FPGAs and microcontrollers. I'm going to discuss the strengths and weaknesses of each and when you might want to choose an FPGA over a microcontroller or vice versa. So first of all, real quick about FPGAs, um, they're built up of basic building blocks. So there's really a lookup table and a flip-flop or a register. Those are your two workhorses inside of an FPGA. And you have a huge gate array, a field programmable gate array of these lookup tables and these flip-flops. And you can uh, create your VHDL or Verilog code to, tell, to instantiate them and make them do different things. Um, and really, you're programming at the discrete component level. You know, you're, you're literally wiring things up. The output of this flip-flop goes to the input of this LUT. And you're literally creating that wire between those two components. And so it's a very different style of programming. And often, there's no CPU. So there's no central processing unit at all. Um, you can have one in some FPGAs. You can instantiate a hardcore processor, which is built into the FPGA fabric. There's a softcore processor, which you can make. You can literally make your own CPU out of flip-flops and LUTs which is pretty cool. Um, but a lot of the times you really don't need one for an FPGA. You can kind of just um, get around the fact that you, you don't have um, sequential instructions like you do in a processor. So that's the really quick summary of what an FPGA does. If you want to learn more about that, I do have what is an FPGA video. So go check that one out. Okay, microcontrollers. I haven't spent a ton of time talking at my microcontrollers in the past, but they are great and interesting. I've worked with them quite a bit and um, they do have a place. So um, there's a CPU, there's a processor, which on the block here is on the uh, this CPU processor on the left here. And there's often written in C, there's often some other things that are attached to a bus that do different things, maybe some timers or ADCs or uh, things like that. So um, there's a lot of discrete building blocks that are basically hard blocks. You can't swap one out uh, willy-nilly or reprogram one. You can kind of uh, control their behavior. So you might have a UART at a certain baud rate, but you can change that baud rate, but you can't swap the UART out for like an SPI controller or something unless it's built into the fabric. So less flexible than uh, an FPGA in that respect. I could talk about microcontrollers for a while, but that's the 10 cent tour of a microcontroller. So what are FPGAs good at? Why might you want to choose an FPGA over a microcontroller? Well, number one thing, parallelization. So if you have to do a lot of stuff at once or in parallel, uh, they're very good at that. Um, especially if you want to do math and especially if you want to do multiplies. So FPGAs are very fast for doing a lot of math operations because they can do multiplies on every single clock cycle of your, of your clock times the number of multiply units that you have inside your FPGA. And all of a sudden you realize you can do a lot of math very quickly inside of an FPGA. Additionally, they usually have a lot of I.O. Uh, not always. Some of them are very small FPGAs, but most of the time um, you find these big components with hundreds of pins, um, sometimes even maybe a thousand pins. So uh, very big designs with a lot of I.O. So if you have a lot of things to interface to, an FPGA might be a good candidate there. They're also extremely customizable. So if you have some really unique uh, niche need that uh, you know, there's no microcontroller that will do this particular protocol or, um, you know, have the number of things talking to each other that, that you need, then uh, FPGAs definitely shine in that respect. And kind of summarizing all these things, there's a lot of high bandwidth capabilities. So if you have a lot of uh, high definition video you want to send around or a lot of uh, analog data you want to digitize and then filter the heck out of, um, you can do all those things in FPGA. So fast, big, um, very flexible. 
Microcontrollers. Microcontrollers are the, the number one strength of a microcontroller is that they are very cheap. Um, you can get a microcontroller for a dollar. Uh, you cannot get an FPGA for a dollar. So um, they're small. They buy. They, they create them by the millions, and so um, they're very very inexpensive to make. And um, that's really the reason why there are so many microcontrollers in this world. There are more microcontrollers than FPGAs in this world because the, they are cheaper. So a lot of the time, you know, your requirement is driven by cost more than anything else. So you really want to optimize your cost. Um, I will also say that they are more simple than an FPGA. FPGAs are relatively complicated. It's a different way of thinking about programming where you have to think, think about, you know, what does this mean to be parallelizable and what does it mean to be able to do things on every clock cycle versus, uh, you know, microcontrollers just running standard C code inside of a processor that's just like, okay, if this, do this, else if this, do this. You know, you've seen these types of, you, you understand this type of code logic where it's top to bottom, execute this, then execute this, then execute this. Not so much with an FPGA. They kind of opt they operate in parallel. Uh, I did mention this, they're physically small, so that can be a big benefit for um, getting into tight spaces and things like that. And there's a lot of common functions built into it. So USB, UART, SPI, ADCs, DACs, all these common things that you might use in uh, an embedded project are really just built right into your microcontroller. So um, you don't need to create your own DAC interface and test it. And you know, maybe DAC's not the best example, but like a UART, for example. You know, if you wanted to, if you wanted to have a UART interface on an FPGA or, or a microcontroller, you would have to you know, either find a core and program that core into your FPGA or start writing a UART from scratch, which would take you a lot of time. You go to a microcontroller data sheet and it's like, okay, here are the three parameters you need to set to turn this UART on and to set it to the parameters you need. Boom, 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 you're pretty much done 15, 20 minutes, you know, you can get a UART up and running on a microcontroller. So um, it's a built-in thing, it's really, it's, it's proven, you know, many bugs to worry about usually, hopefully, hopefully the manufacturer has figured out all the bugs. And so you can kind of just trust that it's gonna work. Um, so that's very handy for uh, kind of getting things up and running quickly and reliably. Uh, there are thousands of variants. So there's a, just an insane number of microcontrollers out there and, and each family of microcontroller has different variants. Some have, you know, one timer, five timers, six timers, you know, this, two ADCs, one DAC, one DAC, two ADCs, uh, you know, two UARTs, one SPI and a, and a USB, two USBs, one DAC. Like you can just mix and match uh, for every single variant, for every single project that you specifically need. So you can kind of pick the microcontroller that is best suited for your application and it's still insanely cheap. So, um, and last thing I'll highlight is that they're low power. So they're generally lower power than FPGAs. Um, because FPGAs need to be reprogrammable and flexible and microcontrollers can kind of optimize power. They can go to sleep. FPGAs have a harder time with things like that. Okay, so really you want to know, okay, what, what, do I, what do I need to pick? Am I going to pick an FPGA to do my job? Am I going to pick a microcontroller to do my job? Um, discuss, I'm going to discuss kind of how you might make that decision for yourself. So most important thing, know what your requirements are. So is my requirement to optimize X variable or Y variable, and you need to really know like what is the number one, number two, number three most important things in that order, and then you say okay, you know which which one solves the problem the best, and so I'm going to go through a couple examples here that maybe will highlight kind of the the decision making process that I would use if I were trying to decide between a microcontroller and FPGA for a design. Okay, here is example number one. Uh, Russell is tasked with taking uh, HD image data from a computer, filtering it, and sending it to an OLED, that's organic LED screen, to display. So a little, little display screen. Um, so HD image data, probably a lot of data. Maybe if I'm filtering it, then I need to do some math operations. So that starts to put me more towards FPGAs, but let's take a look at the requirements here. Um, number one, it needs custom interfaces. So Maybe we, there's not an off-the-shelf part that actually satisfies that. Uh, number two, lots of math. As we mentioned, there's filters, so we're probably going to be doing a lot of multiplies. Um, we, we want low power, if possible, um, and we really don't care too much about cost. It should be cheap enough, but um, cost is not our primary driver here. So for this particular example, due to the custom interfaces, due to the, 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 um, you know, the OLED screen that maybe doesn't have a compatible microcontroller to drive the OLED screen, um, we can kind of do all this stuff inside of a single FPGA. So let's, uh, let's do that, and boom. Uh, the winner is the FPGA. The Oculus Rift VR headset is actually um, using this uh, an FPGA inside of it, perhaps either in the in the 
goggles itself or maybe for some testing. And I actually found this job description looking for uh, an FPGA engineer. So check this out. So I'll make this a little bit bigger. So here's a FPGA design engineer for Oculus um, that is building a, a goggle, a prototyping platform. So I'm guessing this isn't the actual goggle, but it's a prototyping platform for the goggle. So you kind of can, um, you know, cost isn't important for a prototype, so who cares? Um, but you can certainly start testing a new OLED interface, for example, or a new um, HD compression scheme or something like that. So um, quick, to, quick to kind of get things, new ideas up and running that are custom ideas. And so there you go. Uh, there's a you got five plus years FPGA design experience required for this particular role, and you can go work at Oculus and program BHDL and Verilog. So cool stuff. Let's take a different example. Number two, Russell is tasked with taking ultrasonic sensor data, so short range kind of range finding, um, somewhere between like 10 centimeters and 10 meters, for example, and determining the distance. So how far away is you know this? glass from where I'm sitting um, or my entire environment, usually using like robotics applications, things like that. You know, your car has ultrasonics on it so you don't smash into the car next to you when you're parking. Um, so here are my requirements. So I don't really know. This could be FPGA, this could be ultrasonic, but let's, I mean, a microcontroller, but let's take a look at the requirements. Number one, I need a proof of concept in two months. So my manager says, you know, you really need to, we want to, we want to show this thing working in two months. Okay. It's a little bit hard to get an FPGA running in two months, depending on your skill level. So maybe that leans, leans more towards microcontroller. Uh, the second most important requirement is cost. So we're going to make a hundred thousand of these things and every dollar, every cent is important. And so that's really important to us. So we need to optimize costs. So now we're starting to lean more towards microcontroller. Um, it needs to be really low power because it's going to run off of batteries and it needs to have a long life. Okay, well now we're, we're definitely getting towards the microcontroller um, winning the battle here. And we don't really have any like high math needs. It can be slow. It can take its time. So all those things really would point to me and say, okay, yep, microcontroller is the winner here. And I found this uh, example of uh, Amazon Scout, which does autonomous delivery. So there's a battery inside of this thing. It has some ultrasonics probably on the sides. I think that's what those little buttons are for here. And so uh, this would be in a job description for an embedded engineer doing some C design, programming a, a Amazon Scout. So here you go. Here's a job description uh, for an embedded software engineer programming this new Amazon thing, uh, robotics. So um, those are two different you know, types of engineer jobs that are you know, I thought would kind of highlight the two different directions that a company could take depending on their product and their needs. So hope that's helpful. So let's summarize things, what we've learned here so far. Um, microcontrollers are generally easier, faster to program and cheaper than FPGAs. And so that's why there's more of them in this world. Uh, but FPGAs are cool. They definitely fill a niche. And uh, when you use them correctly, they can definitely shine. Um, whenever people ask me, uh, basically like, hey, I need to do this project and I want to put an FPGA in it, the first question I always ask is, are you sure? Because it's a pretty critical design decision that you're making. And so you know, check out all your requirements, make sure that the FPGA is actually the best suited for your individual requirements. Uh, because it is, you know, you're going down a path that's a critical, you know, part. You're choosing a critical part. It's like the heart of your system. Um, so uh, make sure you're choosing the right heart. Um, so yeah, FPGAs are great, but see if you can get the mic see if you can get a microcontroller that does the job too. I definitely encourage you to look at them. Like I said, I've been doing a lot of microcontroller programming. They're fun too. So I hope that's been uh, insightful for you. Do I have another slide here? Yeah, support me on Patreon, y'all. Helps me to keep these videos cranking out. Um, helps me to, to really stay productive and I appreciate the interactions there. Um, talk to me on Patreon, love it. Um, also, if you're interested in doing some FPGA programming yourself, buy a Go board. It's in the YouTube job description below. It's a great way to support me and um, learn a little bit, get some cool hardware. So definitely check it out. It is the best FPGA development board for beginners. So scoop one up for yourself and enjoy working on FPGAs. Thanks everyone, bye.